What's up guys, Pastor John here. We pray that this message encourages you in your faith journey and we believe that God has an incredible plan for your life and our hope is that tools like this sermon will help you become who he has created you to be. Now listen, in order to truly flourish and thrive like God intends for your life, it takes community. What I mean by that is we don't believe that simply by attending church online alone that you're going to be able to become every bit of who God has created you to be and who you want to be to grow spiritually. You need other people. And we would love to help you connect with other people right here at Greenhouse. True growth happens when we're rooted in a community that supports, uplifts, and walks alongside us. And so with that in mind, we would love for you to join us in person on Sundays right here at Western High School or in micro churches throughout the week. Um, listen, if you don't live near our church here in South Florida, please reach out to us. We would love to help you find and thrive in a local faith community near you. We're excited to partner with you as we all become passionate followers of Jesus. God bless you. Good morning, good morning. My name is John. I'll go ahead and clear the elephant in the room right now. That looks, what is that? We did not do that. Some of you are like, wow, that was a lot of work. It was, it was not our work. It was the school's work. They had a play in here. I think it was the Jungle Book. And so the Botany Club uh, did a whole thing. They were like, hey, it was a lot. And we didn't have school Friday, so we couldn't get rid of it. I was like, when you're a church planner, you're like, I'll work, we'll work with anything. We'll figure it out. So in some way, I'm gonna work this into the sermon somehow. Just don't know yet, but stay tuned because it's gonna be awesome. All right, stand your feet with me. This morning, I have titled the message, How to Win Souls and Influence People. If the title sounds familiar, it's because there's a book that I played off of. Uh, and I wanna build on the conversation from last week and really even build a little bit of what God is already doing in this space and in the room. By the way, isn't it beautiful when God's presence meets his people? Like, man, there's something special about that. Whew. It's here, tangible, palpable. The encouragement last week was to make room. Specifically, we talked about making room daily, right? Abiding with God. How many of you gave that a shot? And life-giving time in God's word, right? And we kicked off this time of prayer and fasting talking about make room daily and make room uh, weekly with that Sabbath rhythm. And I hope you gave it a shot and found the life that's in there. I wanna dig a little bit deeper and say, okay, now that I've made that room, I've got that time with God daily and weekly, and I'm spending that time, and I'm, I'm no longer wearing the badge of honor of how you doing, man, busy, but I'm like, God, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not busy, I'm available. What next? What do I do? What does it mean? So if you'll turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter nine, 1 Corinthians chapter nine, we'll be back in Corinthians where we already have a little bit of context as a church family. Uh, we are not in the Super Bowl, in case you were wondering. The Miami Dolphins are out again. I don't know why you're cheering, Brandon. Break my heart, break my heart. I don't know who you got, though. Who you got for the Super Bowl? Just curious. Ravens look pretty amazing. I would like the Lions to win because they're the only other team worse than the Dolphins in their drought, and I feel like if we root for them, maybe God will have mercy on us. So it's a little self-serving, but we'll see what happens there. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you're ready, say, let's do this. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, and he says this, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. I like all his little caveats. Anyone else speak like this? Like you start going and then you go on a tributary and then you go back and just, just me. Okay, cool. Well, I feel him there. He said, to the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. Now, obviously, God does the saving semantically, but he invites us to join him in the process. He says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. And then he gives us an analogy to frame this conversation around. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we do it for an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, take us deeper in the trajectory you've already set us on this morning. Help us to see you, help us to hear you, tether our hearts to yours, and give us grace and courage to say yes. 
however you call us to run and wherever you lead us to go. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. Turn to your neighbor, give him a high five. Tell him, get ready. You can find your seats. I've heard this before, but it really is true. Having kids changes everything. Parents, can I get an amen? I'm gonna step out on the catwalk here to talk to you for a second because this just looks fun. Having kids changes everything. I remember when my, my wife Nancy and I got married. We've been married now over 12 years. It's been amazing. She's incredible. So thankful for Nancy. She's an amazing disciple. And Nancy and I like to travel. And so we would go on these vacations and we would, we would budget and plan and figure out where we could go and, and we would go and we would have all so much fun. And vacations before kids were magical. Like you would come back energized, refreshed, rested. Do you remember? Do you remember? You would get to sleep in on vacation. Like, it was, it was great, and we would love vacation, and, and we enjoyed traveling, and, you know, we, we'd put stamps on the passport, and, and that was our thing, and then we went on our first vacation with Liam, our oldest, and it was not the same. Uh, but children are like walking biological alarm clocks that haveth no sleep in snoo this button to them. And so sleeping in wasn't happening and, and all of these things that we had grown accustomed to uh, when we were, you know, single or, or married, just the two of us, all of a sudden with kids, it absolutely changed. So much so that we ended up shifting the descriptor. We no longer call them vacations when we go with our young seven and four year olds. We now call them family trips. The expectation is different and that's, Great if you can set the expectations up for they're going to be memory making, they're going to be fun, we're going to have a great time, we're going, to have, we're going to take great pictures, it's going to be like core memories for the kids, and after we get back, we feel like we need a vacation from our vacation because it's not a vacation. Parents, you with me? It's a family trip. But it's beautiful, it's amazing, it does something different. This, this holiday season, I told Nancy, I said, babe, I think this was our fa my favorite holidays we've ever had with the kids. Part of it is we stayed home and didn't go anywhere, and that was restful and relaxing in and of itself, but the kids are a little bit older now, they got their first bikes, and so they were like cruising around. We had our own little lash biker gang going around the neighborhood, uh, but probably the reason that it was so enjoyable for me, we, did, we didn't do all the things I would want to do, we got to go on a cruise as a family, we didn't do all my favorite things, we didn't do all the things I would have enjoyed, but it was it was amazingly life-giving, and I loved it because of this. That is our youngest, Lucia, and if that picture does not communicate pure joy in its essence, I don't know what does. I think that's actually the character joy from some Disney movie. But she, this is just, I mean, she loved this trip. My boy loved this trip. We didn't do the, we didn't do the sleep at like 6.40 a.m. Kids are like in our face. Hey, what are we doing today? Like it wasn't sleeping in, we came back, it wasn't. It wasn't all of the things, but it was absolutely amazing because of that little girl and her brother and the joy they experienced. Now suspend that in your minds for just a moment here. There's this clear burden from Paul in the scriptures and what we just read. And by the way, it's not just Paul, it's echoed throughout the trajectory of scripture. This burden is that we are called, we are commissioned, we are created to do whatever it takes to win and save people. Now, obviously, God is a hero. He's the one who does the saving, right? It's by grace alone, through faith alone. But we're invited participatorily into the process of God's rescue mission on this planet. And Scripture says this is not tangential. This is central to our call. This is normative Christianity. This is following Jesus 101. As long as you're alive, you're obsessed with winning and saving. It's God's heart. It's God's heart for us. It's God's heart for humanity. It's what God invites us to. Now, if you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I want to invite you to listen in on the heart that God has for humanity and the heart that he's trying to give his people. You might ask, well, why is this a call to be our clear passion and obsession? At the end of the day, it is because of one thing. It's because of love. Go back to my story with our kids. At the end of the day, with our kids and this family vacation time, this family trip time, what was so important about that time is because Lucy and Liam 
had a blast. My, my core motivation, Nancy's core motivation at the end of the day is we wanted to do whatever it takes so that Liam and Lucy can thrive. Parents, are you tracking with me? Like, we want to see them come alive. We want to see them truly live. If, if I can get us to tap into that mentality of a parent, or for those of you that have had parents, good parents, you, you can get a little glimpse of God's heart here. It's the heart of a Father, it's not about my preferences. It's not about what I would want to do. I want to see my kids come alive. It's the heart of a parent. Now, what Paul is expressing in this passage and what we see echoed throughout other passages in Scripture is God's heart as a parent, as a father, for his kids. And I realize when we come to this conversation, whether it be sharing the good news, the, the gospel, the hope of the world, or evangelism, which often feels like a Christianese cuss word, some of culture might say, oh man, that's, that's awkward. Like, how would we go there? And, and what are we doing? Or some of culture might even view it as, as wrong or say, oh, how dare we say? It's like, well, we're not saying. It's what he said and I've experienced. And, and to be clear, it can be done in very wrong ways. Some of us have experienced, some of us have maybe done uh, sort of religious, nasty, you're, you're not really caring about the individual, you're just making it really at the end of the day about you. It can be unloving and, and religious and wrong, but if you get back to the heart of love, the heart of the Father, it boils down to this. If you just consider humans for a second, the most loving thing that you can do as a human being is be honest about the most amazing thing you've ever experienced. Just think about this, take it out of the framework of spirituality and faith and, and religion, and just think about it as a human being, the most loving thing that you can do as a human being is be honest about the most amazing thing you've ever experienced. How many of you have been to a restaurant recently and you're like, oh my goodness, it was incredible, right? We got some great food all throughout South Florida. Like imagine if you had a coworker and you know they're a foodie and you know it's their thing, and you just don't share, don't share, and eventually they find out that you've been going to this amazing place they've never been to before, and you never even told them about it. And they're like, you know food's my thing. And you're like, well, I didn't want to offend you because I didn't know if you would like it. They would say, man, you could at least tell me about this amazing thing that you love, that you've experienced, that you've delighted, and you could at least let me know. The most loving thing you can do is be honest about the most amazing thing you've experienced. And for many of us, the most amazing thing we've experienced is Jesus. Are you tracking with me the heart here? Now, for some of us, that is not the case. And if you're in that boat and you're like, man, I'm just, I'm investigating Jesus. I'm exploring Jesus. I'm not sure about Jesus. Totally cool. I love how Zach said it, man. Just keep exploring, keep investigating. Our prayer is that you would sense and experience him this morning and realize, man, he is the most amazing thing you'll ever experience. But but for a lot of us in this room, in Guyana, online, that is our story. The most amazing thing we've ever experienced, it's him. It's him. And what love would say, what friendship would say at the deepest level is we share that. Now, this is God's heart. It's the heart of a father for humanity, for, for the people he created. Yet so often, so many of us are so bad at this, myself included, now, I think Paul uses a helpful framework for considering this when he's talking about sharing the good news, the hope of humanity, the gospel, the good news of Jesus. He uses this athletics analogy. And I think what he's trying to point to is you rarely get good at things you don't work on or you don't practice. So this morning, Alan Iverson, I want to talk about practice. Here's a big idea if you're taking notes, jot this down and we'll jump into the text. God's children... Embrace God's compassion for the lost. God's children embrace God's compassion for the lost. John, who are you calling lost? Humanity. Scripture says it like this. All of us are like sheep. We just, we go astray. We go off on our own way. And God loves us. All right, here's the first movement. If we are going to step out as children of God with hearts of compassion, it does not begin with our goodness. It begins with his Point number one is we need God's heart of compassion. Everybody say compassion. Now, the context of this church at Corinth is, I think, helpful to inform the context of our modern world. In the church at Corinth, if you remember, we did a whole series on that, and we'll probably jump back in at some point. The Corinthian culture was a culture of self. 
The Corinthian culture was a culture of self-indulgence and self-obsession. If they would have had technology, they would have been a culture of selfies as well. They were a culture of self. And what we see Paul addressing is this culture of self is seeping, woo, seeping into the Corinthian church as well. The same culture that they're immersed in is the same culture that they are dealing with spiritually and religiously. They're dealing with this culture of self. They're obsessed with their rights. When Paul is going in here, they're like, well, I can do this and I can do, they're obsessed with their rights. They're obsessed with their freedoms. They're making their life about them. And Paul says, listen, you're missing the point. Your life is not about you, it's about him. Just like we sung, it's about him. And because we love him, it's about what, what he loves. And God loves them. He loves the world. He loves the people. Paul's reminding them what Jesus said in Luke 19. We can look at it together. Jesus said this. He said, for the son of man, speaking about himself, Jesus said, here's my purpose. The son of man came to seek and save the lost. Just to get us all on the same playing field, who, who, how many of you were lost? How many of you still are lost sometimes? Or at least you feel that way, all right? The son of Jesus came to seek and save the lost. It's good news for anyone that knows they don't have it all together and offensive to those who think they do. Jesus said he came to seek and save the lost. You're like, oh, thank you, God. Paul carries this thought on in 1 Corinthians 9. Jump back into verse 19 here. He says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew. To, to those outside the law, I became as outside the law. To the weak, I became weak. To the, Paul's like, whatever it takes, I want to be all things that by all means I might save some. You hear this language, it's emotional language, it's passionate language. Here's what I want you to know, as you make room, we've got a final, almost a week of our time of prayer and fasting together. As you make room, as we make room for that daily time with God in his word and in prayers, we carve out space for him, you will experience an overflow of the Father's love in your life that will cascade into Father's love and compassion for the lost. It will. I love that prayer that my mom prayed. Lord, give us ears to hear it if we're spiritually deaf. Give us eyes to see it if we're spiritually blind. This is the natural byproduct of what happens when you get around somebody. The things that they love, if you love, becomes the things that you at least care about. I married a woman who, who's into finding cool restaurants. Like, I ate the same meal in college every single day for a month when Sweet Orva cooked potlucks for me. And it wasn't even particularly good food, but it was edible. Then I married Nancy, and now I'm like, hey, babe, I found this spot on Yelp. I think you'd be really cool. I, I was never yelping before. I'm like, what is cheap? That's what I'm going to eat right now, right? Because love for Nancy changed my preferences. And I've begun to care about the things that she cares about. It's what love does. I need to remind you that you have a purpose and your purpose is not to climb the ladder at your company. Your purpose is not to gain clout on your social media platform. Your purpose is to know God and to make him known. You and I, we exist on this planet to know God and to make him known. And by the way, when we walk in that purpose, there is blessing that we find there. Paul said it at the end in verse 23. He says, I do all of this, all things to all men, that by all means I might save some. I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them. And it's, what does it say? Blessings. Have you ever had an opportunity to pray with someone, to meet Jesus, to lead someone to the Lord? You don't have to raise your hands. But if you have, we, we had microchurch this week and Angel was unpacking the scriptures. I love when Angel unpacks the scriptures. By the way, we're about to launch out a whole group, Angel and others, to launch a brand new microchurch happening in Davie. So if you live in the Davie area and you're not yet plugged into a microchurch or thinking about microchurch, man, I encourage you to check it out. Angel was like, man, he, he's like, man, I remember anytime I've gotten to be used by God to see someone come to the Lord, like, it's amazing. It's amazing. Like, I, take, all, take everything I have at that point. Like, it's not, it doesn't even matter. Like, it's incredible. You were made for, for being used by God to help other people see him. He does the heavy lifting. He does the work. It's his grace. It's his kindness. That, like, we, we know who we are, right? But when you're utilized, and, and, and I kept thinking all week long, I'm like, man, Lord, 
Thinking about last week in busyness, I, I wonder how many times I, John, get so caught up in, in the race and I'm doing the things and I'm running the errands and I'm doing the stuff and yet my deepest desire is, God, I want you to use me to make a difference in, in people's lives here in South Florida for your kingdom and yet the God who's trying to nudge me, I get so caught up and so busy that I miss it and the, my efforts of running to accomplish the thing are defeated by my running to accomplish the thing. Because I'm so busy, I can't listen. The gospel comes with blessings. It's, it's not just for God. God loves people. He wants to draw them to himself. But you've, you've ever sat in a spot where you've been used by God in someone's life, and you have that, like, whoa, that big feeling of, like, whoa, this is, like, some huge thing God's doing. And you know who you are, and you know who you were, and you're like, I cannot believe God is using me. There's no feeling like that on the planet. Are you tracking with me? Anyone ever been there before? You're like, that is life. It's life. He says, I do it for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. So often, many of us try to help a world stumbling in darkness with a great intention and hearts of compassion without blessing it with the very one thing that gives it light. The gospel. It starts with God. We need God's heart of compassion. And then, point number two, this is often where the second breakdown occurs. The first breakdown is do we, do we care? Do I care? Do you care? Do we care enough to press pause on the busyness and be available for God working in the lives of other people? But then point number two, we have to put his compassion into action. Turn to your neighbor and say action. Takes action. Verse 19, Paul says it like this, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. Proverbs 11.30 says it like this. It says, the fruit of righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls, what does it say? Is wise, wisdom. He who wins souls is wise. Maybe six months ago, I shared briefly about this the week after this encounter, but I, I somehow ended up in this small room meeting with a bunch of leaders, business leaders, church leaders, and John Maxwell. How many of you are familiar with John Maxwell? John Maxwell is like the, one of the leadership gurus of our modern day of like the five best-selling leadership books. He's written four of them. I mean, he's like the leadership guy nationally, globally, all over the world. Like John Maxwell is that guy. And, and, I, and I was there in this meeting. A friend had invited me, and I didn't quite know what it was, but he's like, trust me, you want to be there. And, and I ended up being stirred by John Maxwell in a way I never anticipated. John Maxwell, you know, he did a Q&A and people were asking him questions. They were asking him about leadership stuff and they were asking him about, you know, strategic thinking stuff and they were asking him about business coaching stuff. And at some point, someone was like, well, John, what, what's really on your heart right now? And he's like, I'm so glad you asked my friend. You know, he calls everybody friend. So glad you asked my friend. And he goes on to unpack his heart for souls, for people. Now, I, I sort of knew this, but didn't really remember. But John Maxwell, before he was John Maxwell, the leadership sage, he was a pastor. John Maxwell loves Jesus. And John Maxwell started unpacking how at the tail end of his life, as he's beginning to see things more clearly from what he's lived, because he's looking towards the end, he's like, listen, all I want to do is go after the hearts of people that God loves. Because the best thing I can do is share with them the most life-changing thing, and it's not my leadership principles. It's God. So then he's like, well, let me get, the, the other questions he literally answered in like two minutes. What, what about your, what's your best thought on strategic leadership and da, da, da. He's like, oh, da, 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 da. two minutes. This he went for like 50, he had a mini sermon prepared. He's like, let, actually, let me give you my approach to, to building relationships with people and winning souls. Nobody asked that question. He's like, let me go again. So I'm gonna give you his approach. This is what he said. He said, point number one, you gotta be with the lost to earn their respect. He's like, so far too many times, Christians are trying to preach messages that they never live and people don't ever wanna be anything like you, so why are they gonna listen to you? Whew, conviction. He's like, I remember who I was before Jesus met me. And I'm like, man, I, people don't care what you know until they know that you care, right? All that stuff so is like, you, you gotta be with people to earn their respect. You gotta live this thing out, not perfectly, but genuinely with humility, with repentance. Be with the lost to earn their respect. And then, and then once you're there, you need to build a relationship. Trust, love, care, concern. People aren't projects. 
They're, they're incredible individuals made in the image of God with unique stories and unique pain. And God cares about it, so slow down sometimes and take the time to care as well. He said, you build a relationship of trust. He said, and oftentimes, Christians, well-intentioned Christians, stop right there. Well, well I've, got, I've got trust, I've got relationship, he said, but if you don't share the thing with them that you know is a game changer, you don't love them very deeply or very much. He said, then you, you use the relationship as a bridge for sharing good news, evangelism, gospel. By the way, that gospel, that word gospel means good news. It's the message and the hope that Jesus brings into the lives of hurting, broken human beings like you and I. This is what he said. He gets done at this point. He's literally like he's got tears in his eyes. He said, I've written books. I've won accolades. Now here is my single focus in life, souls. I want people, the people that Jesus loves and died for, to come to know him. And I left that meeting with a few leadership thoughts and a heart burning for people and a lot of conviction for busy John Maxwell and much less busy John Lash and how God could use my life. Charles Swindle, the former president of Dallas Theological Seminary, said this, there's only three things that last forever, God, God's word, and souls. And to the extent that you're invested in these, you're invested in eternity. We, we say things in theory that sound like awesome, like, God, I, 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 I love, even when, I'm, when we're singing this morning, and I think we mean it, God, open my eyes, help me to listen, I wanna see you, I wanna see you, Jesus. Jesus is saying, yes, now let's go on this mission together because what I'm looking at is I'm feeling your love and I love you right back and I'm looking at people who don't know that I love them. They haven't had that experience. Verse 24 Paul says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Paul uses this analogy on purpose. He's sort of coming in with the expectation that, that you approach soul winning and pursuing the good news gospel flourishing in people's lives that you love and care about like athletes approach their training with deliberate passion, with a developed persistence, and ultimately with a plan, with a focus, a strategy, a plan for success. Now, at this point, this is where many of us kind of back off this. Well, Pastor John, I hear you. I know. Yes, 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 yes. And, and now I feel somewhat guilty, which, by the way, my, my intention is not to make you feel guilty at all. We're all bad at this. Like, can we just say, like, can we just all amen? How many of you struggle with this? Human beings, okay, we're all bad at this. Um, but you're like, well, Pastor John, that's great. And, and you're like more outgoing, and, and, but I'm an introvert. And this is just not my thing. How many of you were amazing drivers when you first got started driving? Right? Like, you did not start out being an incredible. How many of you were amazing walkers when you first got started? You're like, man, I just started running from the womb. Like, no, right? So what happened with driving is that you learned, most of us at least, learned, right? You, you learned to drive. Like, you realize, wow, this is hard, but it's also important. You remember how terrified you were when you first got behind the wheel? Like, every time, you're like, knees are knocking. Like, that maybe led you to faith in Jesus. You're like, oh, please, God, Jesus, take the wheel. You're not really, Mom, grab it, you know? But you're like, you're freaking out. So did you say, well, I guess I'll just never drive again. No, you did something amazing. Wait a second. So something that was really hard, challenging, and scary, but you realized was absolutely worth it, you learned. You probably did quite a bit of practice, and your poor parents lost some of the years off their life expectancy as a result of it. Or maybe they outsourced that to somebody else. Dri oh, drivers, they're just better equipped to do this, honey, so I just want you to go there. You know, whatever the case was, oh, you can't use my car because it's a work car. You know, whatever the case was, but you learned, you practiced, you trained, you got better. And look at you now. You drive wherever the Lord leadeth. Because that's what it takes. God's children embrace, welcome, invite. God's compassion for the lost. You gotta have his heart. It, it starts with God. Every good and perfect gift, including faith. It says faith, God gives to each one a measure of faith. God gives us his heart for people. Many of us, life gets busy, life is crazy, and let's be even more frank, life is painful. When you go through a difficult season, the most natural response in the world is to turn inward with your life. 
we become myopic, meaning we can only see us and our immediate circumstances. And the problem with that is that Jesus said we are not created to function and thrive in an inward-focused, myopic sense. Absolutely self-awareness, amen, connect with your counselor, love all of that. That's all vitally important. But if you live inward, you will not flourish. We're created to be aware of the inward, but to look up and then allow God, who loves people, to help us learn to look out. It starts with God, his heart, his compassion. But at some point, just like with driving and walking, we need to put those things into action. Look at what Paul says in verse 26. He says, so I, not, I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body. I, I bring it under control. Paul is saying, listen, th this whole, this is in the context of this conversation about people's souls and sharing good news and evangelism and soul winning. He says, listen, this is such a big deal. I'm not just hoping it turns out. I'm not just hoping I magically get good at this. No one magically gets good at this. He says, I have a plan. I have a strategy. I have an approach. Here's my question. I know a lot of us in this room online, Guyana, we are type A people. Do you have a strategy or a plan for soul winning? I don't know if I have a great one, but I got one. We, uh, we do a lot of stuff in our neighborhood. Nancy and I love being in our neighborhood. We made so many friends there, and, and we do these block parties. And so for New Year's Eve, that's what the Lash family did. We went over to uh, one of our neighbor's house, and we had this block party. And, and, and I've mentioned this before, but I kind of have this, this, this thing that I do. And um, I was at connecting with a neighbor. He was newer to the neighborhood. And, and I just have like a little thing ready for whenever someone asks a common question. One of the number one questions, especially with dudes when you're breaking the ice, you'll, you'll chat a little bit, and then they'll say, oh, what do you what do you do? Jesus said, follow me and I'll teach you to become fishers of men. Here's my little fishing line. I'll say, oh man, well, it's, it's kind of unique, but I'm a Jewish pastor at a Christian church. Now this does one of two things. Freaks people out and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, cool. And the conversation ends or they're just like, or they blow right past it. Or they're like, huh, well, how does that work? Or what does that mean? Or tell me about that. Or how did you get into that? Or how did that happen? It, it's a, it's, a, it's a, a simple little phrase for gauging spiritual interest. Now, y'all know me. I am happy to talk about the weather or, or, or whatever, football. Y'all know I can talk about football. Like, I'll talk about anything with people. I just like people. But I have no way of knowing the contents of someone's heart. I don't know if they're open spiritually, searching spiritually, wondering spiritually. I don't know if they have spiritual curiosities. I don't know what God's doing in someone's heart. So I have to have some sort of a strategy, if you will, to, to get a diagnostic sense of where they're at. So that's my strategy. Is it the best strategy? Probably not. And if you have better ones for me, please, I'm, I'm welcome to hear them. But it kind of works. Do you have a strategy? Do you have an approach? And if the answer is no, probably join the vast majority of us, but I would love for you to start praying and asking God about it. I'm not sure this is the best plan, but like Paul, I've, I've, I've got a plan. I've got something. Do you? We had a birthday party in my neighborhood just this past week, and, and we were celebrating one of the kids in the neighborhood, and so my mom was hanging out there at the house, and she had just dropped off Liam, and so she's like, oh, I'll come over and say happy birthday, and so we're like 47 seconds into being in someone's house, and I hear my mom in the background like, oh, well, I'm actually a Bible teacher, and they're like, really? And they're in conversation. I'm like, my mom, like the, in, in the gospel, it says preach the good news to every creature. I'm pretty sure my mom preaches the gospel to iguanas. That's why they're all falling from the trees these days. Like, my mom, they're just getting slain in the spirit. Like, she, my mom is on the evangelism game because she's got a heart for people she doesn't think she's better you ever met my mom she's delightful terrifyingly delightful like you're like I think you're gonna hug me but you could also rebuke me back to the Lord and both of those are important in my life she loves people but man she's ready like spiritually strapped at all times stays ready like <laughs> stays ready God's people put his compassion into action and in our cultural framework, we love to theorize. And I'm pleading with you, me, us, to put his compassion into action. What's your plan? Like, maybe it's a line, like, like me, although do not say I'm a Jewish pastor at a Christian church, because for me that's true, but for you it's a lie. Okay, so figure out what the line is for you. But maybe it's something simple like, oh man, what do you do? And you just say, do you mean my occupation or my passion? 
That's a, that's a cool one, right? Some people, you could tell if someone's like, uh, I don't know, just what, what your occupation, <laughs> right? Not everybody's interested. Like some people are like, I'm not trying to go that deep with you, man. I don't even know if I like you, right? Your occupation. But someone might be like, ooh, yeah, your passion, I guess. Yeah, that's cool. Like, it's just a gauge for knowing what, where are you at with that person and where is that person at with like the bigger things in life? Maybe they're somewhere. Maybe God's been working on their heart for weeks, months, or years, and it's a good work he's prepared in advance for you to walk in. Like, how would you know? Like, I don't know what your thing is gonna be. What do you do? Oh, you mean, my, you mean my passion? You mean my calling or just my occupation? Like, I don't know what it looks like for you, but I know you should figure that out. We're all very different. It looks all sorts of different ways for different people. Like JC and Malik are like walking Christian billboards. Like they wear these like Jesus t-shirts. And I'm like, where do you get your clothes from? Like every single one of them are like, have these little phrases. You seen one these t-shirts before? They, they're like, that's their, and they're like, man, we're both more introverted. So like we're, we kind of put it on our shirt. So if someone asks, boom, we're in a conversation. I'm like, cool, I respect that. Zach is like a spiritual ninja. Zach like goes to the mall and he's like spiritual Jedi. He's like, <sighs> You know, and beelines are like, like that's, that's how Zach rolls. Like that's, and that's awesome. Like AJ, I'm pretty sure AJ has shared the gospel with every single waiter and waitress in South Florida. And a bunch of them have come to Jesus. Like I was, I already had this plan in my notes. And then this morning, AJ was like, man, the other day I was talking to this waiter. I was like, of course you were talking to a waiter, AJ. Like, but that's his thing and I love it. Like this joker has a strategy and a plan. Do you? Y'all laughing because I called him a joker. This is God's heart, guys. I'm trying to make this light because I want to make clear, like, it's, it's, this is judgment-free. This isn't some shame message. Like, we all need to get better at this. We all stink at this to some degree. But this is God's heart. Like, is there anything more important beyond knowing God than making him known? You remember when someone was annoyingly spiritual but awesome with you, and you didn't want to hear it for a while, and then eventually you really needed to hear it? Like almost every single one of us are in here because we can say the name of the person that consistently prayed and shared with us until God opened our eyes and our eternal destiny was shifted forever. What's more important than that? It means everything to him. If, 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 if there's anything in life worth intentional time and effort and pursuit, it's this. Paul says, I, I discipline my body. Other versions say, I pummel my body. Translation, Paul, the evangelist, the church planner extraordinaire is like, man, this is tough. This doesn't come naturally to me. This doesn't come naturally to anybody, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Listen, a lot of times what we're, what we're wrestling with is rejection. What are they gonna think about me? Are they gonna think I'm, I'm judging them that I'm better than them? I don't, like, man, I know who I was. That's why I wanna share because I know I was a mess and God put me back together and it's, he's amazing and I want them to know it. Okay, maybe they'll misconstrue your intentions. You know who got that a lot? Jesus. So much so that they murdered him. And I'm not praying that happens to any of you. But are we even in a space where someone might get a little confused? Or are we playing it so safe that there's no cards even on the table for them to look at? I had somebody ask me, they're like, John, I, I, I like this conversation, like, but how do you, what do you do with Jesus's like wipe the dust off your feet when, when you're, you're talking to someone, like, we're, right? We've all like, God's moved in our lives and we're like, man, this relative that I care about, this neighbor that I care about, this coworker that I care about, they gotta know. And you like share with them and you're like, yeah, and they're like, and it just goes flat. They're like backwards interested. Like they couldn't be more disinterested, right? You're like, ah, like do I just keep pummeling them with the truth? Like I'm gonna pummel them with my love. Like, no, don't do that. You weren't always ready when people talk to you, right? This is, oh, ooh. this is the one plants, another waters. There it is, got it. One, one plants and other waters, but God brings the increase, right? Like you don't know, you could just be a seed planter. Someone else comes along, they're a waterer. Like Jesus said, hey, you share with people and, and, and if it's not their thing, all good, just keep loving them, that's fine. And just make sure, it's, but now they know if it ever becomes their thing or they're ever curious, they know who they could talk to because you've opened that door. Sometimes you share and they're not interested, that's okay, but listen to me. In South Florida, someone's ready, someone's ready. We, we know the data on this because Barna's come in, these 
Groups have come in and studied South Florida. South Florida, uh, a couple years ago, 3% of South Floridians were self-professing Christians. Now, that's a high statistic. Self-professing means, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Many of us know we were that 3%. They're like, I'm a Christian. It's like, no, you are not. But now you are, right? Or maybe you are. That number, by the way, has risen to 4.5% over the last several years. Translation, God is moving in South Florida. You could cheer for that one. That's good. That's good news. Amen. Thank you, Lord. He's, he's at work. That means conservatively you've got 96% of South Floridians who are not yet knowing the incredible life-changing love of God. I would, I would venture to guess that for every single one of us under the sound of my voice, everyone is not ready in your life, but someone is. Some coworker, some neighbor, some family member, some gym buddy, some acquaintance in your classroom, some classmate, like somebody's ready. And the heart of compassion of God is, Lord, bring me to people who are ready and give me eyes to see it and give me your heart of compassion to feel for them what you feel. Here's the application. Ask God for his compassion. That's where it's gotta start. Ask God for his compassion. And then ask God for a plan to put his compassion into action. Ask God for a plan. Ask God for goals. How many of you are goal setters? Any goal setters in the room? All right, a lot of us are goal setters. We've got goals for retirement. We've got goals for career. And I got convicted this week because I was thinking back and I had taken notes on my John Maxwell experience. Do we, do I set goals for the eternal things that scripture points to? In that same interview with John Maxwell, they were asking him, you know, they, they moved on from the souls thing. And they're like, okay, but, you know, in your, in your leadership book about this or the irrefutable longings of leadership, you talked about that. And they kept asking the questions. And then they asked him something else a little bit more vague, like, what goals do you have? And he's like, I'm so glad you asked, friend. And he went off again. And this time he started crying almost from the very beginning. He said, at this stage of my life and career, I have one preeminent, most important goal. I want to win 100 souls to Jesus every single year. This is John Maxwell. And someone was like, oh man, you know, from your ministry, so broad. And he's, he's jumped back in. He's like, let me clarify. That is not from my speaking engagements. That is not from my platform. That is not from my books. That is from my personal life interacting with people. Uber drivers, waiters and waitresses, like people that I meet, a hundred. So he, and he's like, and, and I, I haven't got there yet. And everyone's like, oh yeah, we know. And he's like, I only hit 87 last year, but I'm praying for and I got so stinking convicted, like angel. I got so convicted. I'm like, I don't know who could be more busy as a human than John Maxwell. There might be a few people, but this joker has the busyness excuse to the nth degree. And he just, ha he's not playing that card. And he's like, man, I'm just praying. And he starts talking about it. He's like, man, what's more valuable to God than people? And I can write books and I can do all this. And then people, and he starts, he's literally, by the end of it, he's in tears talking about people that don't yet know Jesus. And this is what he said. He said, so I've got a goal. He said, I'm a goal setter. I set goals for my career. I, I set goals for my book writing. I set goals for my aspirations when it comes to all of these different things. He said, and God forbid money gets more of my type A go-getter goal setter than God. <laughs> Oh, man, that hurts so good. You say, John, that's amazing, but I'm not John Maxwell. And here's what captivated my attention all week long. Like, can you imagine if every single follower of Jesus in Greenhouse, and maybe you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus or you're not sure yet, totally good. First step is find out if he really is the most amazing thing in your life, right? That's where it all starts. Like the most loving thing you could do is share the most amazing thing in your life with the people you care about. You gotta figure that out for you. But for many of us in this room, that is the case. Like Jesus is the most amazing thing we've ever experienced. What if every single follower of Jesus, every single disciple of Jesus in Greenhouse, because by the way, Jesus said, just to, so we're all on the same page, therefore go and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. We all know who we baptize, right? People that were not followers of Jesus that are now followers of Jesus. Like that's, that's how that goes. That's what Jesus said. What if each of us set a goal that we were gonna win one person to the Lord this year? John Maxwell shooting for 100, you're like, I'm shooting for one. That'd be incredible. Like, can, can you imagine the individual stories that would begin to permeate this room, this, fa this church family of people whose marriages were on the rocks, but then Jesus stepped in and restored, of people whose kids were estranged, but then Jesus stepped in and restored, of people who were bound in addiction and they couldn't get out no matter how many substance abuse programs they went to, but then they got Jesus on the inside and all of a sudden everything changed, of people that had no hope, that were bound in depression and addiction and anxiety, and all of a sudden Jesus stepped in and did everything magically get better right 
right away? No, but it changed fundamentally. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? You're like, I don't know, Pastor John. What if I said I would give you $10,000 if you led one person to the Lord this year? You would do it. I bet you'd do it. So it is, not an, it is not an issue of ability. It's an issue of motivation. Can we just all say, like, yeah, I figure out a way to lead one person to Jesus if you're going to be $10,000. Fine, I will. Treasure in heaven. Payable is treasure in heaven. $10,000. Jesus said, lay up treasure in heaven where moth and rust destroy. What do you think that is? It's people. All right, so there we go. Treasure in heaven. Can you imagine if all of Greenhouse lived this? Like just, just our little expression of the church as a part of the, the bigger Capital C Church. Can you imagine if all of the churches in South Florida began to live this out? Like if the Capital C Church became known in South Florida as the, as the place where you're gonna find hope, as a place where you're gonna find love, as a place in an increasingly anxious and, and dis- distant culture where you could find real community and friendship and people who genuinely cared about you. Can you imagine if this became the place, the Capital C Church, Christians in South Florida became the place where people just knew, man, if you're in a bad spot, rough spot, down spot, you feel like there's no hope, there's one place you got to go. You got to get yourself to a church in South Florida. Can you imagine? That'd be amazing. Be life-changing. Our friends, our relatives, our neighbors, our co-workers coming into the kingdom, his kingdom coming, his will being done on earth as it is in heaven, and he's inviting us to be a part. I dare you to set a goal this year of seeing one person through your broken, messed up, grace of God life come to know Jesus and be discipled. I'm gonna close with this story. There's a man named Charles or Chuck is what they typically call him, Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson was the primary counsel for Richard Nixon. He ended up being his hatchet man in the midst of the Watergate scandal and he ended up serving time in a federal prison for what he had done. This is what he says. I'd gotten to the point where I was so hardened, so calloused, I'd walk over my own grandmother if that's what it takes. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know how to fix it. I remember the day I visited Tom Phillips, president of the Raytheon Company. I'd represented their company before, and I was gonna start again, but, but I went to his home for a different reason, he said. I went this time because I heard he had become a Christian and he just seemed so different. I wanted to ask him what had happened. He said, that night I came over and, and Tom read for me from Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, uh, particularly a chapter about the great sin that is pride. He said, a proud man is always walking through life, looking down on other people and other things. As a result, Lewis said, he cannot see something above himself immeasurably superior, namely God. That night, Tom told me about encountering Christ in his life. Now, what he didn't realize was that I was in the depths of despair over Watergate and all that was transpiring. I'd heard that I was gonna become a target of the investigation. In short, my world was collapsing. That night, as Tom was telling me about Jesus, I listened attentively, but didn't let on of my own need. And when he offered to pray, I thanked him, but said, no, 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 I'll come and talk with you once I've, once I've finished the book that you gave me. But when I got in the car that night, I couldn't get it out of the driveway. Here I was, ex-Marine captain, White House tough guy, crying like a baby at the wheel, calling out to God. I didn't know what to say. I just knew I needed Jesus. And he came into my life that night and things have never been the same. Chuck went on to voluntarily plead guilty for what he had done as a result of the conviction as a follower of Jesus. And he served time in federal prison. While in prison, God began to stir his heart for his fellow inmates. While in prison, he said, God, when you get me out of here, I hear your call. I'm gonna give my life to this mission. And he founded what we now know as Prison Fellowship, the largest nonprofit in the nation serving over 365,000 prisoners every year for 40 years. Now listen to me, friends. This is the power of the gospel. It's not just individual people matter to God, but they deeply do. It's that God has put individual people, destiny, purpose, and kingdom vision. And when God gets a hold of a heart, all of a sudden, all of the energies that were used for all sorts of different uh, horrible things or just sort of ambivalent things, all of a sudden come alive. And, And Chuck Colson, the prisoner, ends up leading the largest prison ministry known to date 
because of the transformation of the gospel. Here's what's at stake. When you find a Saul who's a religious terrorist and they're going after literally killing the people of God, but the gospel comes on the inside and all of a sudden the, the, the murderer Saul becomes the apostle Paul and is used by God to plant the church in all sorts of spaces where the gospel had not yet been. You get this murderer named King David who had love for God, but there was all this stuff and then he, God gets a hold of his heart and he comes in repentance and all of a sudden we have transformation at the deepest level and the man after God's own own heart through whom we see this redeemer come from the line of David. His name is Jesus. Jesus came, he said, to seek and save those who are lost. And if you are in the room or listening to my voice this morning and you realize your need, this is the best news imaginable. If you think you got it all together, I'm so sorry. Jesus is not for you yet. But if you realize your need, this is the best news available. You cannot do anything to fundamentally transform your life, but he has already paid the price to do it. And there's no one he can't rescue. And there's no one he can't restore. And if you're still breathing this morning, there's hope for you. There's no one like Jesus. And I'm praying you turn to him today. Why don't we pause just for a moment of prayer together. Jesus, would you move? Lord, as we've been asking this morning to see you more clearly, to hear you more clearly, God, would you speak specific things to specific people in this room of what it looks like to take their next step in their faith journey? Things that you're calling us to, not because you're angry at us, because you love us, not because you you need our help, but because you want us to flourish and thrive because we need your help. Lord, we need you to be the good shepherd. Would you lead us right now? Maybe you're here this morning and maybe you're watching online and you realize you need help. You you need rescue. You need, well, you need Jesus. If you realize you need to turn to Jesus for rescue, for restoration, He promises in his word that, that, behold, I make all things new. If anyone is in Jesus, they become a new creation. All the old passes away. All things become new. If you're like, man, I need that, then reach out to him right now. Say, Jesus, I need you. Wherever you're watching from, in the room, online, in Guyana, Jesus, I need you. Teach me how to live. Teach me how to operate my life. I need your help. I'm at the end of my rope. I humble myself. I repent, which just means I changed my mind. I can't do it on my own. I need you. Forgiveness, the fresh start, the longing of your heart, it is only found in him. At the deepest level, it is only found in him. Maybe you're here this morning and you are a follower of Jesus. You prayed a prayer at some point and you have noticed that your heart has gotten distracted, calloused, jaded, The preeminent occupation of your mind and heart is your own life, not God and his heart for others. I want to encourage you to to invite him in, to repent, to say, Jesus, I want to follow you on your rescue mission. I want your heart of compassion. And then, Lord, give me a plan of action. Give give me an approach, a strategy, something that's intentional. Like an athlete goes into training, I would be intentional about pursuing people because you love them. I want to love them too. If you want to put his compassion into asking, action, just ask him for his help. Lord, help me, teach me, show me. 